Principles. Welcome to the fifth of the six talks in the Modern Money Lab January series. The series was originally conceived for the benefit of our global online master's degree, diploma and certificate in the economics of sustainability students. It's great to be able to share the talks with everyone else. I always like to add that regardless of your prior academic, academic background or where you live or your age, whether you're in your 20s or a retiree or anywhere in between, we'd love to have you join the many part-time students on our courses. Mark Diesendorf is one of Australia's leading ecological economists and an expert in renewable energy. He's published many articles in peer-reviewed journals, a multitude of book chapters and other publications, and at least four books I'm aware of, including Sustainable Energy Solutions for Climate Change in 2014, and of course, with Rod Taylor, the recent The Path to a Sustainable Civilization. Mark is an honorary associate professor at the University of New South Wales, was formerly professor of environmental science and founding director of the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology, Sydney. And before that, a principal research scientist with the CSIRO. He spoke at our conference in 2020 and has been since then a very kind supporter of both the Sustainable Prosperity Action Group and Modern Money Lab. And we're delighted he's been able to join us. And so over to Mark. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you to Gabby for uh, your role in this. It's a great pleasure to take part in this really excellent series on ecological economics of sustainability. And uh, I think I'm number five in the series and I've been enjoying it very much. So um, although I was introduced as, as an ecological economist, I have to stress that I've never done a course in neoclassical economics and that has its advantages and possibly some disadvantages. I was trained as a theoretical physicist and an applied mathematician. So now I'm going to switch to my screen and show you some slides. And I just hope you can see it. Um, yep. Yes. Me. OK. So you can see there my address is the School of Humanities and Languages. It, that doesn't matter because um, although I was originally a physicist, I'm now really an interdisciplinary researcher on sustainability. And in thinking about this presentation, I thought that maybe my contribution could be to, to try to put economics into the whole sustainability uh, scene and to explain the relationships between uh, sustainability and economics. And the first uh, slide that does this and now we have a problem with, here we go, uh, is one that some of you will, will be familiar with. This is the opposite of neoclassical economics. This is ecological economics, where the economy, instead of being the whole, is part of society and society is part of the biosphere. And we, so we have to have a society and an, eco and an economy that is consistent with our life support system, the biosphere. And in the system, solar energy, high-grade form of energy comes in on the left-hand side and low-grade heat energy goes out. And that's what drives the whole system, although that doesn't really appear in neoclassical economics. Okay, so you'll be familiar with some of the existential threats to human civilization. And climate change is, of course, one of the major ones we're facing right now. And we are now experiencing a much higher frequency of droughts, heat waves, wildfires, floods, and possibly strong cyclones or hurricanes or typhoons, depending on what part of the world you are. So that's one of our exist existential threats. And Climate change is just one of six uh, areas that we have now, where we've now exceeded our planetary boundaries. And this diagram sort of 
shows nine planetary boundaries. And if we go anti-clockwise around from climate change at the top left there, we have basically biodiversity is being slaughtered. Land system change, that is through forests and soil de degradation, is also gone beyond the safe zone. Uh, novel entities include toxic chemicals and plastic wastes. Down the bottom, we have the biogeochemical flows of, and in this case, phosphorus and nitrogen, and those cycles are now being exceeded. Ocean acidification is almost exceeding the safe zone. So that's the environmental scene. But together with the environment, ecological economics also considers society. It considers social justice, social equality. And we're in a situation now where the gap between the rich and the poor is increasing. And that gap can be measured in wealth, in income, and in political power. And the results of this is increased poverty, injustice, crime, and loss of trust in democratic government. And then, as we've seen in the US and elsewhere, desperate choices by people who, feel, who are suffering, and they make these des desperate choices to accept autocratic rulers. Sadly, although we have the resources to shrink this gap, uh, the political will doesn't seem to be there at present, but it has to be part of the response. And uh, this nice little diagram from Oxfam really says it all, that um, the top 1% uh, of the population uses, sorry, um, I'm just trying to move the slideshows. Oh, so I can see it, uh, the top. Anyway, the top 10% uses essentially half of, is responsible for half the consumption-based carbon dioxide emissions. So a very important point in looking for solutions is that it is the rich people, rich people, rich individuals, rich countries, which are responsible for most of the environmental damage, not just carbon dioxide emissions. So, and then of course, we are now facing a very serious existential threat in terms of the risk of nuclear war. And as you probably know, the hands of the doomsday clock have been advanced to 90 seconds to midnight. And that's partly on the grounds of the risk of nuclear war, looking at a uh, possible war between US and uh, Russia and US and China, but also mostly also due to the threat of climate change, of irreversible climate change. We are also experiencing threats to democracy and a growing uh, move in many governments around the world towards autocracy. And this is also relevant to what I'm going to discuss. And it's democracy is under siege in, well, first and foremost in the USA, but also in Russia, Hungary, India, Hong Kong, well, in Hong Kong, it's gone, <laughs> Israel, Argentina, and so on. And it, also in Australia, one could argue. And this threat is both a political threat and an indirect threat through the economic system, which is increasingly ruling all of us. Okay, now, why have I shown you all these threats? I've shown them really because they're all linked together. And therefore, we really need to search for solutions that will address all the threats, the environmental threats, the social justice threats, and the threat of war, particularly nuclear war. So one of the links I've already mentioned that rich people and rich countries have the biggest environmental impacts. And of course, environmental impacts are worse for the poor, whether it's droughts or floods or firestorms. And a common driving force of all these threats is the dominant economic system neoclassical economics, or shall we say, immediate, the immediate threat is neoliberalism, which is allegedly backed up by neoclassical economics. And behind that is this whole, whole conceptual area of capitalism. The global economic system is undemocratic. 
it's ruled by rich people, the 1% to a large degree, to a lesser degree by the 10%, and it's ruled by large corporations and rich countries. Now, war has many terrible impacts, but it also has huge environmental and social justice and political impacts. So war also links all these threats together. And it should be mentioned, perhaps in passing, that the, the decision to go to war is rarely democratic. In my country, Australia, the Prime Minister has the power to take the country to war without any discussion in Parliament. And that person has done so several times in the past. So I'm now going to ask, what strategies can we bring to bear on all these threats simultaneously? And what I'm first going to do is to identify the common driving forces, which are really the barriers to change. And I'm going to suggest that, in fact, there are some common barriers that we can address one by one as, as a community, as a series of communities, and weaken these driving forces for environmental destruction, for social injustice, and even in some cases for war. I'm going to frame the problem in terms of the principal driving force being what we call state capture, which means the capture of the nation states, including government, opposition, public service, media, police and military, the capture of those nation states by powerful vested interests. And we all know what these vested interests are. They include, of course, the multinational fossil fuel industry, forestry, armaments, industrial agriculture, the financial services industry, which is mostly devoted to gambling on the stock exchange, the property industry, and so on. And we should say also the ideological supporters of the dominant economic system. So the economic system is both a form of state capture, but it's also a tool for all the other um, forms of state capture. Now, I have to add that captors can include foreign governments, especially those of the global north, which tend to capture the global south. And one would also have to say those, the captors are really very strong, unhealthy influence on, on some international organizations like the World Bank, the IMF and the WTO. Needless to say, the capture of nation states is anti-democratic and it leads to environmental destruction, social inequality, autocracy and war. I'm going to give you a couple of examples from Australia and although the audience is international, Australia is quite important in the climate, energy, fossil fuel seen because Australia is actually one of the world's biggest exporters of fossil fuels, notably coal and what some people call natural gas, but I think we have to call fossil gas. And we see a number of forms of capture here. On the left-hand side, you see two of our politicians in Parliament House worshipping a lump of coal. And the politician on the right, shortly afterwards, became Prime Minister of Australia. The lump of coal was provided by one of the main fossil fuel lobby groups in Australia, the Minerals Council of Australia. And in order, and an interesting feature of this gift is that before giving it to the politicians, they lacquered it so that the politicians wouldn't get their hands dirty. Now, in addition, we've seen what we call revolving door uh, situation where retiring ministers for energy or resources from both our major political parties upon retirement were almost immediately appointed to highly paid jobs in the fossil fuel industry or the fossil fuel lobbying industry. And similarly, the revolving door also rotates in the opposite direction in that in that previous government, the chief of staff and one of the senior policy advisors to the previous Prime Minister was actually appointed from the Minerals Council of Australia. So you can see the very close links between vested interests and the senior politicians. 
In addition, there are huge donations to both major political parties in our country from the fossil fuel industry. So you can see already some of the tools by which the nation state is captured by vested interests. I'll show you one more example, and that is capture of the Australian state by the weapons industry and a foreign power. So in Australia, one of the main advisors on uh, foreign affairs and defense is the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. But lo and behold, this institute, which is treated by our national broadcaster as some kind of impartial uh, source of advice on foreign affairs and defense, that institute is funded by the US government, the Australian government and the weapons industry. Now we've also had revolving door situations with politicians from both our major parties upon retirement being appointed to uh, leading weapons manufacturers. In this case, Lockheed Martin, Lock, start again, Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Now Australia has joined the uh, AUKUS agreement, which is Australia, United Kingdom, and the United States. And this agreement uh, resulted in Australia announcing that it would uh, buy nuclear submarines uh, at, at enormous expense. Now, we, thanks to some investigative reporters in the Washington Post, we now know that five or six retired US admirals and senior military officials from the USA were paid consultants to our Defense Department before that decision was made. So again, we can see in this case, the capture of the Australian foreign affairs and defense industry by the United States military industrial complex. It also has to be said that colonialism is a form of state capture. And although most colonialism is, of, colonialism is officially over, one form of it still exists called settler colonial, colonialism, and that involves land grabs. And that has been taking place over many dec decades still, uh, going into the 21st century in the Amazon rainforest and in the West Bank in Palestine. So neocolonialism now has replaced most of colonialism. And here we have a more subtle form of colon colonialism, uh, but equally dangerous. And in this case, the global south, the poorer countries, have been captured by the global north by a range of techniques. Uh, they borrow money and incur debt that essentially cannot be repaid unless they uh, basically ch move away from self-sufficiency and allow their country to become a source of um, export of, of uh, commodities, uh, resources, uh, and a whole range of other commodities that really do not significantly benefit the global South countries. And there have now been a number of studies that suggests that al although there's often complaints about foreign aid from the global south to the global north, these studies suggest that in fact, on average, there's been a huge net extraction of wealth from the global south to the global north. And of course, on top of that, we see also subversion, coups and invasion by the military industrial complexes of northern countries. So that also has to be part of the mix that we consider. And now we come to conventional economics. And I'm just going to discuss two or three uh, issues that really arise by the capture of our politicians and our media and the public at large by conventional economics. And the first ideological uh, claim of conventional economics is that endless growth in consumption of energy, materials and land and in population on a finite planet is possible and desirable. And yet when you actually examine this, 
it's an absurd claim. And we know already from the slides you've seen about how we've exceeded six out of nine planetary boundaries, that the existing system is very destructive. And although this is not taught in conventional economics, from human ecology, from ecology and basic biology, we know that we humans are totally dependent on natural systems for our survival. All that green stuff out there is not an optional extra. Although for people brought up in cities and educated in their classical economics, they may think that, they, that we can do without them. But we are totally dependent on natural systems and we are destroying them. Well, the arguments, there are many arguments and sets of evidence that in fact that endless growth in consumption is not feasible on a finite planet. And we also know from studies that beyond a certain level of wealth, additional consumption doesn't actually improve happiness or well-being. Growth may be important for some of the very poor countries, but even then it has to be growth with social equity. And then another point that isn't often realized is that growth in consumption is delaying the substitution of clean technologies for dirty technologies. And I'll give you an example from the energy sector, a very stark example. Uh, the two bars show total global final energy consumption in 2009 on the left, and 10 years later in 2019 in the middle of the page. And what you see there is that despite, despite the enormous growth in renewable energy in that 10 year period, and it really has been fantastic, in 2019, fossil fuels still provided 80% of total global final energy consumption, the same as in 2009. And how is this possible? Well, it's possible because consumption has grown so much and much of the growth in consumption has been in transport and combustion heating, as well as in electricity generation. And much of that has still been fossil fueled. So even though renewable energy has uh, grown very, very quickly, uh, it really hasn't made any gains over consumption. You can imagine if you're a runner, coming around the track into the finishing straight, and ahead of you, you see the officials running away with the finishing tape. Now, if you're an athlete, you will overtake those officials in the end, but by that time, we might have crossed a climate tipping point, for example, we might be in a totally irreversible situation. And I'll give you an numeric a numerical example, and this is an update of a paper that Stephen Hale and I did together and published in 2022. And what we, what you see here, or you see lots of numbers, but let's look at the first row in gray. On the left-hand side, we, we have a scenario that total final energy consumption increases by 50% from 2019 to 2050. That is the actual rate of increase of total final energy consumption at present. About, it would get us to about 50% growth in energy consumption by 2015. Now, if renewable energy is to overtake it by 2050, if we go to the next column, it would have to grow 15 times, 15 times as fast as it is growing now if it grows in a straight line. All right, you could say, what about exponential growth? Yes, maybe renewables can grow exponentially. In that case, in order to overtake fossil fuels and replace all fossil fuels by 2050, it went, renewable energy would need to double every 6.2 years, and it would have to double and redouble and redouble and redouble and half another redouble, four and a half times of redoublings in order to replace all fossil fuels by 2050. Now, the other rows show slower growth in final energy consumption, and the bottom row shows final energy consumption decreasing to half 
the 2019 level by 2050. And in that case, it is possible for renewables to totally replace all fossil fuels by 2050. I'll make the slideshow available, by the way, if you want to have a look at the figures. Now, another point to consider is that most, what, why, why hasn't this been discussed more widely in the IPCC reports or the international literature? Well, the reason is that almost all the climate models that have been published assume that carbon dioxide will be removed from the atmosphere by technologies that don't actually exist at scale at present, by carbon capture and storage, which has been a complete failure over the last quarter century, by capture, direct capture of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is an experimental technology. Both, both these technologies do not look promising. The only promising technology is tree planting on a huge scale, but now we are facing the growth in the frequency and the severity of wildfires, which, when they burn forests, release lots of carbon dioxide. And in fact, the black summer wildfires in Australia that we had a few years ago emitted more carbon dioxide than our official carbon dioxide emissions from energy, etc. Uh, but they're not counted. They're not counted in the official figures. Okay, so another issue coming from conventional economics is uh, neoliberalism and the ideological uh, belief that if we shrink the government and public service, we can leave the major decisions and programs to the market. Now, I can't go into any of these things in detail, but the obvious thing to say is that the market is not a free market. It is controlled by the 1% who own most of the corporate shares, who are the directors of corporations, and who make the decisions on what to provide and what to invest. Another point to make is that during the global financial crisis and the COVID ep epidemic, which is still continuing, the market has failed dismally. And in fact, governments recognize this and had to create and spend hundreds of billions of dollars in the case of Australia and many other countries spent much more, created and spent much more to prop up the economy totally against the so-called principles of neoliberalism. There are other arguments that we won't go into now, but we have to kill this notion that we can leave all our major decisions and programs to the market. And then the third, the third neoliberal or the, the second neoliberal ideology that I want to mention is the notion that wealth trickles down from the rich to the poor. And therefore, we should reduce taxes on rich individuals and large corporations because they will create wealth which will trickle down. And what we've found empirically from a number of studies is that this is not true. And the latest study that I've seen is a very comprehensive study, a very large study of 18 OECD countries spanning 50 years from 2065 to 2015. And what this study found, and this is by Hope and Limburg, published in 2022. And what they found was that tax cuts for the rich lead to higher income inequality in both the short term and the medium term. And yet such reforms, so-called reforms, do not have any significant effect on economic growth, if you believe in economic growth, or on unemployment. So this is really a major study. And yet in Australia, we've just seen a situation where enormous tax cuts are being offered to the rich but the current government has halved them to very large tax cuts for the very rich. Okay, so what do we do about all this? And I think we can take a leaf out of the book of US President Franklin D. Roosevelt. He's supposed to have told a, a delegation that came to lobby him, okay, you've convinced me, 
Now get out there and make me do it. And so really what the rest of this talk about is about is how to make decision makers in government and business do it. Now the current situation is that we have very good community campaign, campaign groups in specific areas, campaigning on climate change and pollution and resource depletion and deforestation and war and poverty and so on. And without these groups, we would be in a much worse situation. But the problem is that these environmental and social impacts are being driven by state capture, by vested interests, and I submit by the economic system. And the most immediate part of that economic system that we can actually address firmly is neoliberalism and the neoclassical economics theory that is supposed to support it, but really doesn't. So we really have to, in addition to tackling the specific issues, we really have to tackle these driving forces. And I'm going to argue that, in fact, we can tackle state capture and we can tackle neoliberalism, which really is on the point of falling over. It just really needs a good push and also neoclassical economics theory. Okay, so what are the methods of state capture um, within countries? We've already discussed political donations and election expenditure, that can be controlled. And in fact, it is controlled in some countries and even it controlled to some extent in some US states. We can control revolving door jobs. Um, we do have some in Australia, some nominal controls, but they're never implemented. We used to have controls on concentrated media ownership. So you couldn't have someone like Rupert Murdoch earning, uh, owning uh, the majority of the media in a particular country or, or all the media in a particular city, which is the current situation. We used to have laws against that, but they've somehow been weakened and, and have disappeared. We, we need to deal and counter the so-called think tanks that put out a lot of the ideology that is uh, used by vested interests. Well, fortunately in Australia, we do have uh, one or two alternative think, think tanks, which have been very effective. Uh, I'm thinking of the Australia Institute in particular. We need to know who, politici who politicians are actually meeting in, the, in work time. We need to publish the work diaries of politicians. We need to monitor government procurement and so on. So all these things can be done, but they need the concerted effort of all a large range of community groups, not single groups, to put overwhelming pressure according to the suggestion of President Roosevelt. Now underneath the horizontal line there's some more difficult tasks that need to be addressed. Reducing the powers of corporations. In a so-called free market there are laws that give enormous powers to corporations. So it's certainly not free from that point of view. For international uh, conflict it may be very useful to remove the power of veto in the Security Council of the United Nations. We need to address sovereign debt and trade dependence and structural adjustment, which is keeping poor countries poor. And so on. So governments aren't going to do this if we just reason with them. If we just go and talk to President Roosevelt or the Prime Minister of Australia, or the President of the United States. They, they won't listen to reason alone. We have to have a very strong political power, and that means building alliances between environmental, social justice, uh, trade unions, peace organizations, so that they have a very strong force to pressure governments and business to dismantle the tools of state capture to terminate neoliberalism and ultimately neocolonialism as well. 
And there's a large literature on tactics, strategies and tactics, and I won't go through them here. There obviously isn't time. But I'll remind you that there have been many great successes by social movements opposing injustice, uh, inequality and uh, unfairness and environmental destruction. And so some of the examples are, of course, the expulsion of colonial uh, Great Britain from India, the nonviolent movement uh, by Mahatma Gandhi, the achievement of at least some civil rights for black Americans, the achievement of votes, votes for women. Not achieved in every country, unfortunately, but in the vast majority of countries. The achievement of removal of slave, of official support of governments for slavery, even though we know that some forms of slavery still exist, at least they are no longer supported officially. And we've seen the nonviolent overthrow of governments in a number of countries, in the Philippines, in Argentina, and, and elsewhere. But the success of those movements depends on organization and on building a strength, a very strong movement. The community has the advantage of numbers over the very rich and powerful who are small in numbers, but very high in wealth. So it's essential, and this is a basic principle in, articulated in trade unionism and elsewhere, that, that organization of the large numbers of people potentially who can move social change is essential. Organization is critical. Let me give, now we actually need groups that will try to bring together environmental and social justice and peace and trade union and health and, and other groups together to exert this pressure on governments and business. And I'm going to give you two examples. <clears throat> the first is an international one called ATAC. Uh, it was founded in French, in France. So it's actually Association Internationale, etc. But the English translation is the International Association for the Taxation of Financial Transactions and Citizen Action. And originally, this group was set up basically to, uh, to push for a Tobin tax on financial transactions, national and international. But it ha has broadened out since and is now concerned with the environment, with human rights and trade unions. It is opposed to neoliberalism and, and supports participatory democracy. And you can read about that. And in Australia, formed only a few years ago, is a group called the Australian Democracy Network, and it was founded by jointly by the Australian Conservation Foundation, which is one of our major national environmental organisations, community-based, of course, the Australian Council of Social Services, which is concerned with social justice, again, community-based, and the Human Rights Law Centre. And that group has started the process of bringing together environmental, social justice, and human rights organizations to oppose state capture and enhance the democracy. And in fact, they produced an excellent report as one of their first reports, an excellent report on state capture. Now, of course, there's also community action at a local level, and that is important. It has benefits in terms of community education and community empowerment, but on its own, it is not going to achieve the, the transformation that we need to transition to a sustainable society because the government decides on so many critical things. It decides on infrastructure and land use planning, pollution control, public facilities, taxes, rules for banking, you name it. The government has to be also pressured and individual projects, while they create education and empowerment at a local level are not unnecessary, but they're not going to be sufficient for changing uh, society. We are facing social dilemmas and we need collective response. Now, 
I probably don't need to say much about ecological economics because it's been very well treated by previous speakers, but I love Crispin Tickell's description of treating the world as if we intended to stay. I think that's that's very a very good statement, summary. And of course, one of the key things in ecological economics is that it prioritizes ecological sustainability and social justice or social equality over economic efficiency, which is of course the main goal or one of the main goals of neoclassical economics. And of course, one of the main environmental goals of ecological economics is a transition to a steady state economy. And of course, any such transition will in involve degrowth of some economic activities like fossil fuels and growth in other economic activities like renewable energy. But furthermore, I'm arguing, and it's, uh, but it's only one strand of ecological economics, I'm arguing that we actually need a planned degrowth of the global north. And that is far more controversial and not all proponents of ecological economics support it at present, although I think the logic is inescapable. So planned degrowth is a planned program to reduce, and it's defined in physical terms, as is the steady state economy. So it's a planned program to reduce the, the use of energy and materials and land and to stabilize population to bring the economy back into balance in a way that reduces inequality and improves human well-being. So it is significant that it's defined in physical terms and not monetary terms. And basically, the attitude is that the fate of GDP is irrelevant. GDP is a very poor measure of human well-being or planetary well-being. So we need to focus directly on well-being and sustainable prosperity, of course. And um, it should be said, because I was for a long period an applied mathematical modeler, that there's been some very interesting modeling done of degrowth, which show that under some circumstances, it is possible to maintain full employment. Uh, physical modeling has been done in Australia. Um, by physical modeling, I mean looking at not at money, but at resources and energy and people. And that modeling has been done by Graham, Graham Turner in Australia. Macroeconomic modeling has been done for Canada by Peter Victor, which could be helpful in converting at least environmental economists to think more seriously about degrowth. Although personally, as a mathematical modeler, I look at the assumptions that go into macroeconomic modeling and shudder and think you could prove anything. And that's no disrespect to Peter Victor, but it's just the status of macroeconomic modeling. And then a very interesting simulation modeling by Simone D'Alessandro and colleagues in France. So although much more research is needed on how, on the implications of planned degrowth, we really need to make a start. And perhaps a good start is to start with the well-being economy that is not determined by uh, uh, by GDP. Now I can see Gabriel looking at a watch, so I'm going to uh, finish up very soon. Um, uh, the strategy is pretty obvious to drive the transition. We have to weaken the tools of state capture, demolish the very low remaining credibility of neoliberalism, promote the well-being economy, in implement universal basic services and a job guarantee, which has been discussed extensively by such people as uh, Jason Hickel, for example. And we need to disseminate the insights of modern monetary theory to assist the financing of the transition. So um, I'm going to skip over universal basic services. I think you're all familiar with this idea. It's nothing terribly radical. Denmark does most, most of it already. It means more public education, public housing, public health, public transport, and so on. Uh, so it means that people have the basics and there's less drive for 
for wealth. And universal basic services can be implemented within a market economy uh, that prioritizes ecological sustainability and social justice. I won't talk more about the job guarantee. Uh, again, underlining that modern monetary theory has potentially very large contributions to, to make to financing the journey to mount sustainability. And here's a plug for our book by Rod Taylor and myself, The Path to a Sustainable Civilization. And I think the other book I would strongly recommend for people who are new to this field is Less is More by Jason Hickel. But for those who want more from Jason, he has published at least a half a dozen excellent papers after he published this book, and they are well worth reading. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention, and I shall try to end the slideshow. Thank you, Mark. That's so brilliant. Um, those solutions that you talked about uh, are terrific. You know, just to lay it out there on one page, it's extraordinary. I, I love um, I love to see that. I really do. Um, and there's lots of comments in the chat as well. Um, I wonder if we could take a few questions. Um, there are, uh, there's a couple of questions on, there was a little bit of a side discussion about um, nuclear power. And I know you've had a long, <laughs> a, long a long career and talked about this a lot, but um, uh, Peter asked the question. I'll, I'll just read it out from here. Um, Peter says, I'm not very knowledgeable about nuclear energy and hear mixed messages from all sorts of experts. Some say nuclear is absolutely not a way to go, no matter what, what while others say technologies like molten salt reactors could provide a safe way to produce nuclear energy. What are the facts around this? And should research and development into safe nuclear be abandoned or is there any potential alongside renewables? Okay, so research and development into new forms of nuclear reactor for commercial nuclear electricity production is receiving hundreds of billions of dollars in the US and UK and elsewhere. It's been incredibly unsuccessful. So there's been enormous hype about new types of nuclear reactors. The favorite one is the small modular reactor Although a few small reactors do exist, they're totally unsuitable for mass production. And um, so far, the only company that looked like it was going to develop it in the US, uh, a company called NewScale, received huge amounts of money from the US government and has recently announced that it is abandoning. Okay, so the first thing is there is not a commercially available new reactor, despite all the hype. And it won't, there won't be one commercially available for at least 15 years or 20 years. And by then, Australia, certainly, and many other countries could be running 100% on uh, renewables, wind and solar, with some hydro, uh, for example. So that's the first thing. But, but the other reasons for not going nuclear are it is incredibly expensive. In fact, the whole... Even the pro-nuclear people have recognized that existing reactors are ridiculously expensive. They're three to four to five times as expensive in producing electricity as wind and solar are now. And wind and solar power are still getting cheaper all the time. So there's the cost barrier. Too expensive, um, too dangerous. Nuclear power is um, not only dangerous in, in terms of nuclear accidents, but dangerous in terms of its contribution to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And a number of countries have used nuclear power as a cloak to hide their development of nuclear weapons. India, Pakistan, North Korea, and South Africa. And by the way, South Africa is the only country that developed nuclear weapons and then dismantled them and discontinued. Countries that attempted to use nuclear power to develop Nuclear weapons include Argentina, Brazil, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, ooh, Libya, uh, and Australia back in the 1960s. Fortunately, all those projects were dis 
discontinued. So too expensive, too dangerous, uh, too slow to build. It, it takes it takes decades to build a nuclear reactor. Uh, we're seeing that the situation in Europe, two nuclear uh, nuclear reactors being built in Finland and in France have and now have taken at least three times as long as predicted, three or four times, uh, and in fact uh, have cost at least three times as much as the initial costs, enormous costs. We're talking about 30 billion pounds mm -hmm. for one nuclear power station. Okay, so probably that's enough to say about nuclear. Uh, please, if you hear the hype, mm -hmm. just put some salt on it. <laughs> I think... Um... Uh, somebody's mentioned here in the chat um, about, um, you know, the MMT approach to finding the money is not really the issue here. It's really the resources as well. So yes. the materials and the labour and the, you know, the land and all of that stuff. But a very important point that I think Stephen might want me to make is that when a government creates and spends money, it can spend some of that money on increasing the economic capacity of the country by building infrastructure, by training people, it mm. can actually increase the amount that it spends without risking inflation. And, and that's a point that I think needs to be emphasised again and again. Yes. I'm going to be a little cheeky here and ask my question <laughs> and then we'll, we'll come to some more in the chat. Please, if you've got a question for um, Mark, would you like to type it in the chat? There's a couple waiting, but um, I think... Uh, we'd be happy to have uh, other people's contributions to the questions as well. Uh, my question is, um, I've just been reading recently about um, uh, some uh, good news from America, which on the face of it, I think is good news, which is uh, President Biden has has halted or paused a whole lot of uh, LNG projects. Some of them are really quite big and climate uh, activists are celebrating the win uh, but others are saying that it's actually because uh, there there may not be the gas there to um, to warrant those projects, and perhaps it's not such a um, moral decision as as a pragmatic one. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I must confess, I'm not familiar with those particular projects. My main fear is that if Trump becomes president, he will remove mm. all the good work done by Biden and Obama before him. And, uh, well, we already saw what he could do previously. Yeah. Well, see if he can stay out of jail. <laughs> no, I think in jail is quite fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, there was a, another question um, from Peter, actually, which, which I wanted to ask you about, which is I've just got to scroll back and find it. Um, uh, uh he, if you can't i'd like to know what mark thinks about holistic management and planned grazing techniques as promoted by alan savory um so a process to reverse desertification well i don't specifically know much about alan savory's approach but i've seen a number of approaches by different people who've achieved the fantastic things mm. in transforming the land and um, I think that should receive very strong support. It, it really is a very important part of the transition to sustainability. Thank you. As is, as, as is eating less meat. <laughs> and so far, I'm only a half-time vegetarian, but I'm working on it. Yeah. It's, yeah, I think um, all of these little things that we can do they really do make a difference, even even if you think you know your part is only a, a tiny drop in the ocean. It makes a difference, I think, even just talking to people. You know, talking to people at the checkout in the supermarket. Oh, why are you buying all this vegetarian stuff? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it opens up conversations. Um, there was a comment actually uh, further up from Peter uh, about citizens' assemblies as being part of the um, the suite of things that uh, would make a big difference 
Yeah, I I totally agree. I I think that that that's part of the move towards greater democracy, and um, we should see more of it. Mm. The the sad thing is that most people think that democracy is limited to to voting once every few years, uh, but actually, we need to have people and local communities making local decisions or having very strong input to local decisions and beyond. And of course, governments like to pay lip service to that, but um, in practice, want to keep very tight control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So We had a good with... example here in South Australia with the, um, with the nuclear waste dump and there was a, a, a very well-designed I guess, citizens' assembly process that ended up making the decision that was really not what the state government wanted at the time. So uh, good on them for sticking to the the answer that it came up with, I think. Um, just there's another question here from Chris. Um what would you say to political parties who are blocking economic migrants? That's a big, uh, thing, actually. I I think one can interpret economic migrants in opposite ways. So I need a bit of clarification there. What do they mean by economic migrants? Um, are they? I, oh, I, they're coming to. I think they mean. Australia. Migrants who want to improve their economic uh, situation. Well, uh, this is a very difficult question because it 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 becomes part of the issue of limits to population. Mm -hmm. And so, let me start at the global level, which is the easiest. Clearly, we cannot keep having global population growing more and more. And although uh, we are told by the UN agency that uh, handles population that population growth is leveling off and it'll soon be horizontal on a global scale. If you look at the records of that organization, they have for decades underestimated of world population growth. And mm -hmm. there is concern that they've been influenced unduly by another vested interest, namely the Vatican. Uh, yeah. which has mm -hmm. very strong uh, ideology supporting endless population growth on a finite planet. So yeah. that's the first thing. At a global level, um, there has to be a limit, and perhaps it will naturally limit. Uh, but uh, I think I I'm certainly opposed to uh, policies, the sort of policies that were implemented in some countries, which are very forceful. But I think... You can do this with a series of economic incentives and disincentives. Okay, now what about Australia's population? Um, we often hear the claim that Australia is an empty country and um, why has it only got, well, I think it's now 27 or 28 million. Uh, the harsh truth is that the vast majority of Australia is pretty well uninhabitable. Yep. That's, that's the situation. Uh, in terms of also. water access to water, in terms of soils and so on. It's it's an ancient country and much of it is totally unsuitable for agriculture of any kind, almost. Uh, it's suitable for hunter-gatherers, uh, but 28 million hunter-gatherers are not, are not possible. So I, I'm in favour of limits to national populations, and that will make me very unpopular. Uh, people will say that's racism. I would say that's complete nonsense. Um, we're not distinguishing between different groups. I'm totally in favour of increasing uh, immigration of people who are in desperate need of refugees. I think we could double or triple. But we also have a whole lot of people who buy their way into the country by... Um, essentially bringing millions of dollars into the country and, and, and they are warmly accepted immediately. So I think there needs to be a change in the structure of immigration. 
but certainly the several hundred thousand net immigrants per year in this country uh, are environmentally and in terms of uh, social conditions not feasible. What we can do is greatly increase our aid to poorer countries. Yeah. And, and I think that is absolutely essential. Uh, and but we also have to deliver that aid in a way that it doesn't go simply to governments, but it goes to the people who actually need it at the village levels and so on. Yeah. I guess that's, one more that's a huge question, actually. It's a huge question. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would resist uh, those people who say, oh, we can't talk about Australia's population uh, because it's somehow racist. That's complete nonsense as i said mm -hmm. there's a lot here in the chat um i'm just trying to there's a the continuing discussion about land use and uh still um uh there's a big big discussion about pareto efficiency which i actually <laughs> I, I might have to let Stephen take that one i reckon <laughs> no don't bother <laughs> okay. Well, one could say one thing that, as far as I can understand, looking at that as a scientist, Pareto efficiency is something that doesn't exist and could never exist in, the, in a real economy. It's got so many ridiculous assumptions underlying it that I find it really hard to see any use in, in the concept. Do you have any? Absolutely. Yeah. And oh, that, is, that is the concept of efficiency in neoclassical economics. That's the only point I was making. It makes no sense at all. And actually, quite often, when ecological economists talk about efficiency, they're using the word in a much more sensible way mm. than neoclassical economists uh, 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 use it. Uh, uh, that was what we were discussing a little bit in the side panel. I, I could add that um, efficiency improvements are sometimes argued are going on all the time in terms of, say, energy use per unit of GDP. And the data suggests that the amount of energy that we require to an, for an extra unit of GDP is decreasing. And that's absolutely true on a global scale, but it's very misleading because although energy per GDP is increasing, energy use is still increasing. And similarly with material use. Uh, so we're talking about increasing efficiency, but in absolute terms, the use of energy and materials and land are increasing still very rapidly on average across the world. Mm -hmm. So talking of efficiency in this case, I would say is misleading. Thank you. Um, Stephen, can you see any questions that I've missed? No, I think you've, you've, you've covered them all. Let's, there is one thing we could do, though, and I, I know you've got them both there. Uh, uh, Mark and Rod Taylor's book, The Path to a Sustainable Civilization, which, uh, amongst other people, is recommended on the cover, if I remember rightly, by Bill McKibben and Stephanie Kelton, uh, is a terrific book which covers a lot of what uh, Mark has been talking about in more detail. And the other thing that people might uh, want to track down is, and you will, I think you also have a copy with you in the office, if you're interested, although this, obviously Mark would say this book is some years out of date now, and of course this is an area where things move very, very quickly, but nonetheless I think this book from about a decade ago is still very worthwhile reading. Um, about a decade ago, Mark was writing about the potential for us to move towards a 100% renewable uh, energy system with a high degree of reliability. And that's obviously much more, uh, it appears to be much more widely understood now than in the past. So I think that's a great book. Uh, I hope Mark might even um, come out with a new edition of that book, maybe. <laughs> Oh, and, and the other book as well. The other book was the one. Well, that, yeah, so. thank you very much. I've also got one to wave around. Uh, so that's the recent book mm. uh, by myself and Rod Taylor. Mm. And um, and Rod and I are doing talks around the country, um, trying to get the message out to people who are 
initially, I wouldn't say we're totally speaking to the converted, but people who are open to hearing about the need for us to get onto a sustainability path that includes environment, social justice, and peace in particular. Mm. And, you know, we really have to change public attitudes. And uh, I, it was brought home to me um, this evening by an interview, a new program on ABC Radio National, Global Something or Other, uh, with two of our famous uh, ABC people. And it was it's about war and peace, really. And they opened the program by interviewing John Bolton, who yeah. was one of the architects of the murderous attack on yeah. Iraq by the United States uh, under the lies that um, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And they allowed him to basically say that the US should take out Iran mm. as soon as possible, or preferably last year, and there was no no reply from anyone. I, maybe next week there'll be a reply, but allowing this extreme uh, warmonger to to deflect attention from the role of the United States in the Middle East war that's going on at present and blaming it all in Iran is a bit thick. Yeah. And yet, and you know, there are people who could answer that very well. And I guess I'll write to them, but for what that's worth, <laughs> to try and get someone uh, like Alison Bronofsky or Sue Wareham, who can easily answer the, the extreme claims of someone like John Bolton. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that interview. It was oh. quite shocking. Yeah. Um, and the idea of, um, you know, a preemptive attack on on another country just because you think they might do something in the future. It's just, yeah, pretty dystopian. One of the policies we're recommending, to, one of the many policies we're recommending in the book to reduce the probability of war um, is, to, or of nuclear war, is to get all countries to agree not to make a first strike. And unfortunately, the United States and NATO, which is totally controlled by the United States, refuse to do that, which not, is not exactly helpful for um, reducing tensions. Yeah. Um, let's have a question from Susan, perhaps just to finish off with tonight. Um, I'll read it out. Uh, Susan says, I think we underestimate the amount of strategy and planning that formidable private interests have, that they have mobilised for decades to shape, um, sorry, I lost it, to shape the market economies that we have and the extent to which these efforts have promoted a widespread pathological relationship between wealth and well-being." Yeah, interesting. With that in mind, can you share your thoughts about alternative measures that might capture progress or not? towards a well-being economy? Well, I think the first step is what our treasurer sort of hinted at uh, last year, which is really to in, in, introduce more indicators of well-being uh, so that we're not stuck with GDP alone, mm -hmm. uh, indicators of health and employment and um, housing and you name it, because these are the important things. GDP is doesn't really tell us anything about that. And we need to consider social equity. So we need to consider who gets what. And so I think that's an important first step. But we also need to change our institutions, basically, so that we we create social structures and laws that that basically foster a more equal society. And I guess um, Stephen could say more about that, but that would include uh, in the banking area. Mm -hmm. uh, it might include uh, doing away with the Reserve Bank. I don't know. <laughs> Central banks, there is an argument for doing that, but I can't really assess that. Uh, but, but also politically, that, that 
you could have laws, uh, you could have rules that a politician can only be in parliament for perhaps two terms. And mm -hmm. that would mean it gives less time for politicians to get captured. Um, there are related political systems that encourage um, wider representation. We see one, one in New Zealand and one in Tasmania where um, we're not always, you're not always dominated by two major parties. Now, although there is some hope with the rise of the teal independence and the growth of the greens, um, the political system, the voting system is such that it still makes it very difficult for any but a, one of the two major parties to, to become government. Uh, so changing the election system, the election laws, well, that would require enormous pressure and wouldn't be too easy, but I don't think it requires a referendum. Thank you. There's some... Um... There's a, a quite a lot of um, uh, links here in the chat for people who want to follow up on some of the things we mentioned. John's posted that interview with John Bolton if people want to grit their teeth and listen to it. Um, Peter's um, posted a link to Transparency International. Um, there's also uh, Tom suggested perhaps we could mention Rod Taylor, your co-author, has a new podcast series coming out, which is Rethinking Sustainability. I hope he's going to interview you. I think he's interviewed us all, actually, pretty much. Or... Oh, okay. You've already done that. <laughs> I think he. I think there are lots of interviews in Rod's yes. uh, back yeah. pocket. Ah, yeah, he's but... done a lot of interviews. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, we must look out for that. That's excellent. Uh, I've just gotten um, into Planet Critical after hearing Stephen's interview that came out the other day. I hadn't actually heard that podcast before, and there's hundreds of episodes to catch up on. So it's all very there's there's a lot to learn and a lot to listen to um and yeah and just a a, a last um uh plug for citizens assemblies i think um uh peter writes that citizens assemblies have the potential to make political parties and lobbyists redundant and yeah i think i think there's some great work going on that go, going on in that space and Let's see more of it. It's really fantastic. Um, Should we wind up soon? Yeah, I, I think um, I think I, I think we've covered most of the questions. If we haven't covered your question, um, and you'd like to email us later, uh, I'm sure that would be fine. We can pass your question on. Um, I, I let me just uh, say I, I noticed that uh, Phil is with us this evening. So if we're talking about alternative indicators, we ought yep. to mention the genuine pro progress indicator. Of course, which is one of the pioneers of if politicians in the future uh, need a, a single point indicator rather than a, rather than uh, just a, a panel of them. In terms of uh, balancing the discussion, um, we many of us would love to have access to our national broadcaster, the ABC, a little bit more, and we'll be prepared to go on uh, more often. Um, uh, for the most part, we're not asked, or occasionally were asked. Uh, there have been occasions in the past where people from our side have been going on relatively prominent TV shows and one political party or another has effectively got them banned or refused to participate if they've participated as well. But some people are a, bit, a little bit scared of us. That's one reason why it's so great to have Stephanie coming to Australia, because Stephanie cuts through in a way that actually none of us can over here. Uh, we saw that last time she was here. Um, I can't really explain this to you, but every newspaper wants to talk to her. TV stations want to have her on. Uh, radio shows want to have her on as well. So it's fantastic. She's coming back in March and we'll work her almost to death while she's here because uh, there's a, there'll be a huge amount of things to do. And I thought last time she was here four years ago, if we could have had her in the country for six months instead of two weeks, I could have changed the country. Uh, 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 by the end of that. So do, if you are in Australia, especially in the Eastern States, do come along and meet Stephanie and come and see the movie. But I just wanted to finish myself, or Mark might want to say something else be be before we actually finish. 
by saying Mark and Rod's book is full of great ideas. There are some other um, books which overlap with it, which have been written in the past as well. But in the end, hard though it is to do, if we want any of these ideas to be enacted, there isn't anybody except us to do it. And we are, we might be, people with the same interest as us broadly might be in the majority, but people that are actually prepared to do anything are still in a tiny minority. So I know I'm talking to the converted here, and most of you do more than me, but we all need to keep, as we sometimes say, pushing, mm -hmm. persisting until something happens. For Gabby and me, the courses that we run with Torrens University are part of what we do to push. And if there's anyone who would like to participate in them who's not already doing so, we'd love to have you. But there are dozens of ways in which you can participate and dozens of institutions you can get involved in. Gabby and Annie are both in Extinction Rebellion, um, uh, which deserves a mention here uh, because of what... Uh, one of the slides that struck me uh, in Mark's talk was the one with FDR saying, you have to go and make me change. Yeah. They won't change the voting system. They won't do anything at all for politicians unless we force them to do it. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I... Absolutely. I think, totally yeah, agree. If young people are moving in that direction and, and anything any of us can do to help would be great. And thanks very much, Mark.